Well, my name is Ricardo Terrell, and I'm broadcasting here from Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, you mentioned the title is quite long, right? Build a performance and polygon inter-service communication with gRPC and, of course, in .NET Core. Uh, long title, but really boiled down to the fact that uh, gRPC <clears throat> is a tool that can be used for real, real cross-platform communication when performance are uh, uh, the key component. And uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm a big performance junkie. And gRPC, I really fall in love with gRPC. They, and um, what is also interesting, it really integrate quite well with uh, .NET Core and other programming languages, but particularly with .NET Core, starting with uh, uh, .NET Core 3.0, uh, Microsoft decided to integrate gRPC in the part of the framework, which is uh, quite convenient. Uh, the main key, um, as I mentioned, is a fast cross platform um, for uh, high performance communication and really aim to solve, mitigate the issues of the communication when we are in a microservice architecture or distributed communication, any sort of communication service to service, gRPC really make it much easier uh, to solve this kind of pitfalls. One thing that uh, we'll demo also later is a great support built in for streaming communication and bi-directional streaming communication client to server. And uh, also integrate quite well with ASP.NET Core. Now, one thing that um, uh, I believe the Microsoft decided to, to integrate gRPC part of the framework is that .NET Core um, no longer have the support for the full framework, right? Which uh, um, it make like the end of support for the WCF in, in the future, right? I, I'm not going to talk about WCF in this presentation, but uh, if you have some project that uh, use WCF uh, and you are considering to migrate to migrate to .NET Core, definitely gRPC represent a valid migration uh, alternative. So there are many ways in which <clears throat> um, two or more microservices can communicate over the network, right? Um, in the history, like one upon a time, we have like back in the 70s, RPC as, as a remote procedural call, um, one of the solution, queuing and so forth. And uh, later, um, most recently, we have, you know, from XML over HTTP to SOAP, and then we move to uh, JSON over HTTP uh, to REST. And REST, it is de facto um, the way we today model the, the, the API. Uh, for example, uh, you know, when we'll be when we have to build like a, an application or a web application, we get you know some design, some requirement, and we start to, to build application. So we could have something like a server, the process, and expose some API through HTTP. And then we can have a client or multiple client that consume this API. And you know, further, we can have more complex uh, scenario where actually the uh, server itself have to communicate with external services, and everything you know looks you know quite familiar. And we can host the application as a, a monolithic application, like we can host all this application on one server that most likely can run you know in one process. In this kind of scenario, you know, we use REST, which is, you know, perfectly fine. In general, uh, REST is fine in many cases. And um, so REST is a, is a really is a client-server relation where backend data is made available uh, via simple uh, representational state like JSON to the client. And REST protocol um, really does not enforce, however, um, uh, the rules about how it should be implemented, um, should be implemented at the lower level, but rather provide you know, uh, guidelines for an higher level architecture implementation. But really, uh, overall, uh, REST is fundamentally based on communication of JSON over HTTP. So we're building an API where um, we use JSON as the payload, and then the request or response 
to communicate between services or kind and service. And then we have in the HTTP verbs such as get, put, post for, um, for the call between endpoints. So this is great, but these days where something, uh, you know, uh, we build application uh, in a different way. Today, we like to build application, you know, in a more complex system. We, we pass from uh, that kind of architecture, from monolithic, you know, multi-tier, so forth, architecture, architecture. And then we have uh, uh, these days something, you know, that, uh, uh, more trendy, such as microservice architecture or distributed computing. And the microservice, microservice architecture style, you know, has been really, um, it's taking the, the, the industry software by storm in the recent years with the promise um, to deliver a resilient and scalable system. And of course, these days, it can be easily dockerized, right? So in a, nut, in a nutshell, um, microservice architecture um, ten, a, a aim to break up you know, the single classic monolithic software into a new, you know, into a several, um, in, in, into a number of independent and distributed component in which each component run in a, its own process and perhaps communication with others. Um, and, you know, and this is really the trend architecture these days, but with that introduce also more complexity, some challenges, especially um, from the communication point of view, where we might have to communicate between services that are you know, a different machine, different processor, and perhaps use different platform, or maybe they be implemented using uh, different programming languages. So, um, you know, in addition, there are some challenges. So how can we guarantee, for example, that the API are compatible over time with the evolution of each service, right? How can we handle the communication between, you know, service one to, to service two, and possibly, you know, in a synchronous fashion to be scalable, responsive, and keep uh, those components decoupled and, and compatible. Well, let's bring it to, uh, to gRPC, right? So what is gRPC? Uh, gRPC is a, um, a framework, an open source framework designed uh, for scenario where communication efficiency is critical and it also can target and run in many different environments. So uh, one key is that gRPC is contract based, right? Which you use um, this contract used to generate uh, the service, the client, and the message type code uh, for every major you know, computer programming languages. And so the contract based approach, you know, initially when I start to uh, familiarize with gRPC, I was not really keen about the idea to have contract based framework, uh, probably because back in the day it was burned by other frameworks. However, it really does make sense in a microservice architecture because um, gRPC um, allows us to generate uh, client and services that know and that we're able to communicate uh, with the right shapes and use the call as, a, as expected, rather right, that they need. So let's take, for example, uh, ASP.NET application that uh, consumes some API uh, exposed by third-party service. Well, that service potentially could evolve independently. We no guarantee that the, the HTTP API will evolve in the same way. So how can we preserve the backward you know, compatibility? Uh, it really become a challenge. Therefore, uh, the link between the API owner and the caller, you know, had to remain quite loose. So this one, well, one of the scenarios where gRPC can help by keeping different services communication compatible and, inter and be able to interrupt um, over time. So the key component um, of gRPC uh, performance, right, is uh, gRPC used as, as um, uh, a smaller and faster binary protocol for the communication called protobuf. And we're going to talk about protobuf coming shortly. And the gRPC is also leverage the HTTP2 feature and which support multiplexing requests over um, 
a single connection, uh, which enable you know uh, responses to be sent soon as they are ready, without you know to put in a queue and then some sort of delayed and extra overhead. Interop, um, I mentioned fully cool platform. Um, JPC is not just a framework, but provide a set of tools and library for all major uh, programming languages, including you know, .NET, but Java, Node.js, Python, of course, Go. Streaming uh, is support natively part of the framework. And uh, JPC is full bidirectional, uh, support full bidirectional streaming communication that can op uh, operate over um, intercommunication, um, can go across uh, load balancer and um, service clusters. Timeout and cancellation, uh, this is actually very cool. Uh, cancellation can be propagated through the gRPC calls from service to service, but also from client to service to help uh, not just to stop an execution, but also to enforcing some limit of resource consumption. And um, client may also abort on cancel an operation on the service side using just a cancellation token. Um, so really, it really allows us client to uh, specify how long they are willing to wait for a for an RFPC call to complete, and then have a timeout or a cancellation token uh, that is propagated and uh, stop the process. That uh, actually work quite nicely. We have a demo for that. So this is a huge plus coming from um, a traditional, uh, you know, REST API where the cancellation support uh, client to server is not that easy to implement, right? Uh, it's not built in. You can implement it, but it's just very painful. It's no fun. And uh, security is uh, um, also integrated part of the framework because JRPC is implicitly secure as default because you use HTTP2 over uh, TLS for end-to-end -to -end, uh, communication where the connection is fully encrypted as default. So gRPC, um, um, well, RPC as a remote procedural call is not, um, is nothing really new, right? But um, the way that we communicate between services today allows us to um, review and reconsider back this protocol as a potential uh, good solution. So RFPC, um, in a nutshell, is a call to a function they run on a remote server. Basically, we deal with a local function that the same signature contract of a remote function. So we're calling the function locally, but actually transparently, we, we are passing uh, the argument is any to a function that is executed on uh, a remote server. So for the past 15 years, um, Google has uh, worked around this, uh, work with using this protocol and evolved this model internally with a project that was called initially Stubby, uh, which is uh, an RFPC call, an RFPC framework that consists on a, on a core component layer that can handle you know um internet scale of 10 of billions no million billions with a b or request per second so the framework has been then open sourced uh, in the back in 2015 under the name of grpc where apparently the g has nothing to do with google it's just g as grpc so grpc as part of the payload uh use this uh, binary format um, rather than JSON as in REST. And this binary format is called Protobuf, which also was implemented by Google as had the main goal to be light and high performant. So there are several challenges, as mentioned, when we use a microservice architecture. Um, for example, we have the need to take into account when implementing a new system from transforming uh, the system uh, from a monolithic architecture to a microservice architecture. architecture. But JRPC gives us all a very rich set of tools and capabilities to um, solve, to fight these issues without having 
to implement your own framework. The best part, in fact, of gRPC is that it's not just a library, but really uh, provides this rich ecosystem as well. And um, all end up to create your protofile, that is the file definition as the contract, and then use the protofile um, with the tooling to do a code gen for the client, the server, and all different kinds of programming languages. And really make the, uh, allowing this uh, RPC framework and uh, to build services that use a single API, no matter what language they are written. All right, let's take us to um, Protobuf. So, so JPC used a Protobuf uh, and the protocol buffer as um, an interface definition um, for um, a language for uh, serialization and communication instead of text-based like JSON XML. And uh, Protobuf, protocol buffer, can describe, um, describe the structure of the data and the code then can be uh, generated from this description for creating and parsing a stream of byte that represent then the underlying data structure that you predefined. So Protobuf is um, really a language that is a platform and, and language agnostic, right? It's just a mechanism, a neutral mechanism for serializing in a very fast way structure that um, produce a very small binary footprint that is sent over the network, which make RPC call very, very fast. So the goal of Protobuf um, is um, to be very fast for network communication, but also for serialization and deserialization of your data structure. And this is possible because the type are predefined. They are known. So the, the, because you use data structure, uh, then um, thank you to, uh, thanks to the contract-based approach, uh, the types during the serialization can be inferred directly and can be incredible fast. So this is a, an example of a protobuf. And um, so uh, this is like an example of protofile, which represents our schema, uh, our contract. And um, then we can use this uh, file here with uh, some command line tooling, but you can just also refer to your project and uh, um, enable the compilation type, uh, the build option to protobuf, which is an option that should become available in the project uh, whenever you have installed and reference the gRPC tooling. Um, and uh, here are the, the protobuf, the protofile here as a, a different kind of section. We have the top one where we define the syntax type. The, in this case is the proto tree, which is the latest version of your um, other protobuf language definition. Then we have the section where we define uh, the namespace, this is optional, but become very handy when you use um, programming languages like C Sharp, that we can reference then the code gen using this name, same, the namespace here uh, defined in this file. And in this section also, we can import um, other packages, can be other protofile and can be Google protofile packages that in this case, we import the timestamp proto, which is a, a Google protobuf that allows us to sort of interrupt between .NET, daytime, timestamp with the type the protobuf is able to understand. Then we have the service definition, and this is our, the, the list, the series of methods that uh, our service is going to expose, and the code gen is going to implement it. In this case, we just define the name of the function and either uh, in both the input and output of this function. In this case, the stock request, the input, and the stock data as output. And then um, ultimately, we define the, the message type, right? Uh, where um, protobuf is ordinal based, which means that the order uh, by um, the order the field in our messages are very important. In this case, we define our message with the uh, message keyword and then the list of fields that are just a um, um, key value um, pair where we define the type. In this case, the first one is the, a string named symbol with, of course, ordinal one. And then we have a 
uh, timestamp uh, name date or ordinal to. And this is the input, and then we have the stock data, which is the output here. So when you define your proto file, then you um, reference to your project. In this case, this is a project file of the NSP um, um, SP file. And um, what what is recommended that I, I do is recommended is uh, have your separate folder external for your project, part of your solution, especially at multiple projects, this become very handy. And uh, so you had um, a proto, the proto file defined this folder, then again can be linked to all the projects that, uh, that use this proto file. So you have only one single spot where you do all the changes and the changes then uh, propagate to all the projects that link this file. So the project file, we have the uh, proto buff section here, the item group. Which include the proto file, and then we have the service uh, gRPC service definition, and this is a um, now the gRPC tooling. What kind of generation uh, do we want? In this case, the server. As you can imagine, the code gen is going to target only the service side, the client option only the client side, and the both. Well, it's going to produce the code gen for both the client and the server. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, when uh, we talk about how import other protobuf module or file is that the reason is because natively protobuf um, does not support all the .NET types or perhaps all the types or all the programming languages that gRPC support. However, um, so for example here, uh, there are a few like the uh, .NET, DateTime and uh, the Decimal are not supported natively. Um, however, um, it's possible to create uh, a message definition to represent like the decimal, for example, type. They work, you know, uh, for the serialization in a safe manner between .NET client and server. Uh, however, you know, a better uh, approach as we did is that um, gRPC provides a series of extensions, right? So we can specify some gRPC uh, extension called well-known types which is a set of external module that uh, gRPC uh, provide that you can use for your uh, favorite programming languages, um, which uh, the, the idea is they provide uh, and facilitate the code generation and runtime support for complex field and complex type like this. So how are we gonna start using gRPC? Well, um, Microsoft uh, collaborate quite extensively with Google to make it easier to integrate, to integrate gRPC in a uh, um, .NET Core project, like SPLT Core, for example. Uh, this screenshot um, is Rider, for example, which is my favorite IDE. And um, there are already available templates to start creating gRPC project, uh, of course, with the constraint to use uh, .NET Core. When you create your service, the gRPC service, the data structure become you know quite familiar. If you you know this is a the this structure represent uh, like a, a very similar to an SP data stru uh, project structure. The only difference is that uh, the project um, reference the underlying gRPC in libraries and toolings, but is also this folder with the protos which contain uh, all the proto files. So where does gRPC belong, right? Where should it stay in our architecture? Well, first of all, you know, gRPC support uh, support is built on top HTTP2, which currently is a limitation. Uh, so if you have if you need something like for client browser communication, probably gRPC is not the right tool now. There is currently in progress a work. Um, for a gRPC sort of JavaScript library, but it's not ready yet. So in general, gRPC really stand between your microservices or you know communication between client as you know desktop console application to your service. But the front end, um, it only is the connection uh, connect the microservices to sort of like a um, API gateway to your microservice cluster. Um, using you know your plan HTTP API, and I have a good example for this. So uh, let's uh, let's demo. So the the demo we're gonna run is a stock market um, history ticker that generates some stock uh, 
read it from a local um, CSV file, and then the gRPC server read this, this data and then dispatch this, uh, this data to the gRPC client that you know, can use either you know, a, a response request or streaming communication. Um, and then ultimately later, uh, I'm gonna demo also the web app using WebSock and, and SignalR. Um, one slide before the demo, one gotcha that uh, I learned a hard time. If you're working in .NET Core on a Mac OS, as I do, you might run into some problem when you, you run a gRPC. Uh, you're gonna get an error or something like that, HTTP 2 uh, and TLS is not supported or, or it's not working. And this happened because uh, currently at the moment, Kestrel does not support HTTP 2 with TLS on Mac OS. But there are two uh, simple um, solution here. On the server side, you just define that the HTTP 2 is going to be communicated using uh, HTTP, not HTTPS. And the client side is going to switch the context to an encrypted HTTP 2 support. Of course, this is going to be only for your development time on your machine in production. This is going to be removed. All right, so demo time. Let's go to my uh, project here. So first of all, we have the um, ticket generation, uh, which is a service that what it does is read from a local uh, file system, the stock ticker CSV file. The folder is in data tickers. There are different kinds of CSV file. Uh, by the end of the presentation, I'm gonna provide the link that you can download all the source code so you can play it yourself. So, so the service here read from the CSV file and expose a series of API. For example, they retrieve stock history, take a ticker as input, uh, transform that in a in a series of stock data and send the response back to the caller. And uh, we have both um, single call response and then we also also streaming supporting for the stream. Uh, uh, demo in this case return in a single numerable to read the stock data as a string. Uh, when I read the string here, we have the CSV stock stream class. We take a file info in the constructor, and then read uh, all the data from the CSV file, parse it, and create a collection of stock using this function parse here. It's all asynchronous of blocking, but this is just boilerplate. Uh, we, this is just to let you know this is the service that produced the data, okay? And we have the stock is this shape here, the symbol, the date, uh, and then we have the price of the stock, the highest, the lowest, the open, the close. So this is the service. Um, and then we have um, the stock ticket service. And then now we have the service. So um, I'm gonna show first the uh, traditional REST approach. And then we're going to see the gRPC version to compare the two. So this, the rest, the traditional REST server is, um, I use dependency injection to uh, create a singleton instance of the stock service that they just show for the uh, stock ticket generation. And then we have the API controller. Uh, I grab the stock service instance, and then here I have a two API, okay? One is a, an API that uh, take a symbol as input in a request, and then call the stock service to retrieve all the stocks and then send it back as a huge payload. Now for the demo purpose, I only retrieve the first 50, but you get the idea here. It can be a very large number of, of items. On the other side, another solution that in REST is quite popular is actually have some sort of pagination approach where we have multiple calls that uh, it passed in also, also an offset. So in this case, we can paginate and uh, return part of the response, only a portion of your data. So this is helpful when you want to reduce the, the size of your the payload. However, on the other side, this has become a little bit of limitation because you have a lot of calls and requests become very chatty. So let's run the server here. Okay, the server is running. 
Okay, dot net run the client. The client uh, while it's running here um, is a console um, app that uh, I Ricardo, thought... can, can I quickly interrupt? I can yes. maybe zoom in a little bit more in the editor. Bigger? Yep. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Sure. So on the client side, we have the uh, we create the HTTP client that target the endpoint or our server, which is 5000. And then we have a uh, simple uh, while loop here where I can insert the name of the tickers that I want to get the history. And in this case, for demo purpose, I grab all the history of the specific symbol. But if I ask for Microsoft ticker, just uh, in this case, I'm going to call the other API so you will see how we're going to get uh, different requests and different response with the off offset approach. When the response is coming back, I get the stream from the response. This analyzes in a, our stock model, which contains the collection of stocks, and just print in our console here. Okay, this is not running. I had a problem before, so let's run this way. All right, so this is the client running. Um, let's call Facebook, for example, and then we got only one in one transaction or our Facebook information here. Um, let's run, uh, let's rerun it. So we got Facebook, uh, let's go Apple, and you can see all in one transaction. And then if we call Microsoft instead, you can see there are different kinds of requests, and then each request is going to fetch back an offset incremental. This is a, a different pattern. All right, so that's the traditional REST. Um, so let's see the same implementation using Jira PC. So first of all, we have the Jira PC service, uh, which is down here. So the structure of the code, first of all, I have to define um, in the, the in the startup of my web app, then I want to add gRPC. Okay, uh, I'm gonna. This can be. I can pass some option. This is um, arbitrary. In this case, I only enable some error details. So during the bugging tile, if something happened, I have a better error information. But uh, this is just good for development time. I can pass other options such as compression, the message size, and so forth. This is during the configuration service. Below uh, on the configuration, I have to specify that uh, my gRPC service uh, type, in this case, the stock market service. This is because gRPC service are not only really, uh, like um, web API that is uh, the API, but it's for the service itself. So after I've done this, that's really much what I have to do. So let's check the service. So the service, the, the gRPC service, I use dependency injection to retrieve the stock service for the stock ticker. And then I override a series of methods, the get stock, get stock history. But where does override come from? How can you change this? Well, if you notice here, the stock market service actually inheritance from a stock market service base class. And this is actually the base class that if I have 12 over, uh, this is a bunch of code gen that gRPC generated for me uh, based on a contract base from my proto file. Okay, so this is all code gen uh, for me. So then in my service, I just reference the service uh, stock market service base class here and then override the method. The proto file that I, uh, has been used to generate this class here, in the, this, the solution is inside the folder called protos. And there is a stock of proto file, um, which defines the namespace, the reference. And this is the method that I define in my stock market service, okay, with the messages defined here below. Um, so each, each of these methods then is defined on my service here. So if I just search, here it is, this is the stock, get stock method. And it generates for me all the method with the uh, stock request and the uh, server call context. If it were streaming, I have uh, part of the 
construct, I have access to the stream request and the I server stream writer. But we're going to check this in a second. So this is my service. So I suppose these are series of methods that then call the underlying stock ticker service and return the result as um, um, using the proto, proto buff message defined. So let's run this service here. Uh, .NET run. The DN is an alias that I use on my local machine for .NET. Okay. So and now my service up and running and I won't touch it anymore. So let's call the gRPC service, so the client. The client is defined in this case a simple console app. Later I have a web app, the function is a client. So first of all, as I said, I switched the context to be able to run this code on Mac. I create a gRPC channel. In this case, the channel target the endpoint of my service that now is up and running. I create an instance of my gRPC client passing the channels in the construct. And the stock market service client is also one of the code gen that gRPC generated for me. If I have 12, this is a bunch of code here that generated for me, but I don't want to waste time here. So now I have the client, which is my gRPC client service. And then I run this method here, which is a, again a while loop that access that uh, um, I'm going to pass as input my um, picker, send a request to, to retrieve all the stock history of this uh, symbol here. Okay. And then I'm going to print in a console. So this is a, a first demo. So let's close the rest here. .NET run here. Okay, so Facebook, FB, they're going to call. You can see some login here that they get a request to my service. And here I get all the Facebook return on my client. I'm going to go Microsoft, another one, different symbol, different color. And I get all my data back, right? So this is great. But here we have also the limitation that we saw earlier about what, what are the options when we have to retrieve a bunch of data, right? And we're going to check streaming in a second. But first, I want to show you another cool demo that I have the service up and running. The service is in C sharp, but now I want to call my service using, for example, a Python uh, client. So I have a project here, my gRPC Python client. So uh, Python is one of the um, language supported from gRPC. To start in Python, you just install your tooling, gRPC, gRPC tool. There is a nice documentation online that uh, in gRPC.io, uh, that there is a quick start that you can use as a reference to use different kinds of programming languages. And it's actually documentation is very nice. So when I install all the tooling, I can use a command line, in this case, pass here, uh, where I target my protobuf file that I just showed the stock proto uh, file, stock market proto. And also Python do some code, gener uh, code generation. And here in the folder, the Python client uh, project, there is all this code gen here. I'm not going to go in detail because there's a lot of code generated for me. But it's nice that uh, the tool does it for me. So now uh, I import the module on my code gen. I create an instance of my channel targeting the endpoint of my service, which is the C sharp running. And then I'm going to call the service. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to create the service tab, passing the channel constructor. Then I do a call using uh, the Microsoft as a ticker. But actually, I'm going to skip this simple call and I want to uh, do a streaming demo. In this case, I'm going to call the get stock market stream because I think it's very interesting how we can leverage stream capability from a service using C Sharp and a Python, uh, um, a Python project. So this is the project I'm going to run. Then I'm going to call the the this uh, service endpoint and going to print and console my price as a train. So let's call this guy Python here. This is the Python project. I'm just going to call Python and the client API. And now I'm going to start to stream here on my console, the Python library. And you can see that this request here. So in this case, there is a stream channel open on the service side that feed uh, the stream to the, the downstream Python uh, console app, which is, uh, I think is quite cool. All right, so 
let's go back to the slide quick. So in a demo, we saw the um, United communication. So JPC support four type of communication channels. The United communication where the client send a single request to the server and get a single response back, just like we saw, just like a good function. Then we have the streaming, um, server streaming, where the client send a request to the server and get a stream um, to read as a sequence of messages back. So the client to read from the return stream until there are no messages available. And what actually is very cool is that gRPC guarantee uh, message ordering for the individual RPC call. Uh, one option that, uh, you know, um, this is the, the demo was showing in the REST, the traditional REST wave like a large data to return. Uh, the classic approach would be to include the array of items into uh, a serialized object, right? In this case, all items would be, um, had to be generated before the request can be returned, which can have like a, a high, you know, resource consumption. And, but in addition, also the payload size can easily grow. So that's when I demo the uh, pagination kind of approach, right? Streaming here fit quite well as solution. And then we have this, the client stream, um, the client streaming where the client write a sequence of messages and send them to the server. And, and when the client is finished, write the messages, you wait uh, from the server to a uh, response back, right? And also in this case, the message order are guaranteed. Streaming is really fit quite well in a, um, the streaming communication base fit well in uh, .NET Core, especially with the lately introduced iSync uh, enumerable interface, which we can leverage to process asynchronously and you know, blocking the stream until there are no messages to process. In the guest talk market stream in a slide, and uh, when there is the stream defined as a part of the communication type, we have the iService stream writer uh, argument that we can access to write on a downstream, in this case to the client, using the write async. If it were like a client, uh, there will be an uh, iAsync stream reader that will be used to read the downstream up to the upstream. And of course, you know where I'm going now next is the bidirectional streaming communication where both client and server send a sequence of messages using a read and write stream. And what is cool is that the two streams operate independently. So the client and the server can read and write uh, in whatever order they like. So for example, um, the server could, uh, could wait to receive all the client messages before write the response as a stream, or it could alternately read a message, then write a message, such as like um, sort of like a ping pong pattern, or any sort of combination that uh, you can use using a read and write approach. And uh, also in this case, by, with by the, the bidirectional streaming, uh, the order of messages in each stream is preserved, right? While the stream can operate completely independently and in a uh, no blocking fashion. So, so the, the, the pattern we talked earlier, you know, the, the chatting pattern, REST, and in general, in distributed architecture is, you know, it's called an anti-pattern. And um, so the chat style is used when API in which the client need uh, multiple call, need to place and, and, and run multiple call, multiple requests in order to receive all the data that it needs. But on the other side with the stream capability, the, um, like in gRPC, um, it's possible to leverage, you know, uh, the stream capability, also the bidirectional channel between the endpoint. So messages can be exchanged real time without pulling and all the extra overhead introduced. And uh, the streaming allows, uh, um, what it does, it create this long live connection between the sender and the receiver, um, which, uh, over which multiple messages or frames can, send, uh, can be sent asynchronously. So multiple stream 
can operate independently over one single connection. And that's where, you know, the key here is the HTTP2 uh, support that give us uh, multiplexing um, that allowed, you know, multiple gRPC call uh, to communicate over um, a single connection without the extra overhead of disconnecting, reconnecting over and over again. Uh, and and this is really move a uh, huge extra overhead uh, compared to the traditional HTTP uh, forms of communication. And um, the, in addition, the request multiplexing allowed also uh, multiple parallel uh, requests for data. So it's now it's possible uh, using multiplexing to download or upload, for example, multiple files uh, uh, concurrently over one single request. So, so let's demo the, the streaming now. So back in our code. So the server is running. So uh, the service here, we have our service. So we saw the single call. Now we're going to get this get stock market stream. Now this is defined our protobuf, and the only difference that we have to do to um, enable a stream capability communication type is add the stream as a keyword here. Okay, that's all. At that point, the code gen. It generated for me the method that enable streaming capability. In this case, is a client streaming capability um, where the actually the server stream back to the client downstream um, and access the uh, server stream writer uh, stream. So when this call uh, is executed, I can access the response stream and write downstream to the client the stock as a, as a stream. Okay, so the client side here for this um, service is our, um, you know, the example I showed you earlier, we create the gRPC channel, the same pattern. We use the service client code gen, passing the construct of the channel. And for this demo, I'm gonna cancel the streaming after five seconds, just you know, to demonstrate how easily can be an operation canceled. Then we have the, um, we're gonna call the get stock stream here. And from the replies, we can access the, uh, oops, sorry, got back on me. Okay, we can access the response stream, read all the data synchronously as a stream, no blocking with our synchronous for each loop, and print and console the result. Okay, and uh, remember that this is gonna stop after five seconds. So the stream client here, is our project. I'm gonna run the, the project here. And soon it's run, you're gonna see gonna start to process the stream um, asynchronously. Streaming, uh, okay, it got stuck here. Uh, Sometimes it's stuck, so let's run it from here instead. Sorry about that. Okay. All right, so we have the streaming now that run all the data uh, that come from the upstream, the service, and then it stops at the five seconds, you see the stream has been canceled. And that's actually, uh, you know, quite nice to have this part of your tool set to be able to cancel easily a request as a stream uh, with a cancellation token. So this is it was uh, the streaming uh, cancellation, uh, sorry, the streaming uh, from the server. The bidirectional is a little bit more complex. So in this case, we have the code on the server that gets uh, stock stream actually in both bidirectional. So having a constructor here passed an async stream reader, get a request stream. And this is going to use to read the service used to read from the client stream. So the client gonna push a stream of data on the server through the stream here, the request stream. And then the service stream, the response stream, the server use actually to write back to the client. So in this case, I have a thread running, which start to uh, write to the client a series of data as a stream, okay? I use the channel here, sort of like to mimic a producer consumer pattern. So I'm gonna write to the channel that is going to be passed in this uh, synchronous for loop here, and then send back to the client uh, in, this, uh, in the response stream. 
And then we the the server, the service side is going to start to read actually the stream coming from the client, and uh, which is going to send requests for different symbol. So what's going to happen here? We have the server. They're going to start to send a stream of data to the client, and the client after a little bit they're going to send a, a stream of data to which the type of uh, symbol data that the service should should uh, send back. Okay. Then we wait for all to stop here, which pretty much is uh, for all the stream to complete. And here is the function where I read from the uh, stock service ticker, produce the data, and pass to the channel, which is then passed up here, right to the client. Okay, so the service is already running. Let's see, this is the bidirectional. So uh, let's run it. Okay, now the client the, the client is already start here to write uh, the request received from the server. But here you can see how the server will log also that receive a different request. So the request that the service is receiving actually is a stream from the client. And here is the stream the client received from the server. So you have two streams that run independently and asynchronously. And there are you know all the order if are preserved, which is uh, quite nice. All right, let's stop the client here. So we demo the streaming uh, uh, from uh, server to client in the bidirectional. Let's go back to the PowerPoint briefly here. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the performance in this case, which is uh, yet one more reason why you might switch to gRPC. But um, the, the the, the faster is interesting, but there is also, you know, the resource consumption is also reduced to minimum. And this is because um, protobuffer uh, use this binary format, which is very much, uh, is more compact than a text based like JSON. And this reduction of size uh, make your code run faster, but also uh, have uh, less CPU consumption for the serialization or the serialization of a more compact uh, format, which means also less allocation, which means also less GC generation and better performance. In general, you can see from the slide, from the chart, the um, orange is the protobuf, so the smaller is better in this case, uh, because it's, which means take less time, which is faster. And the payload size is about eight to seven times smaller with less CPU consumption. In a, in a solution, I'm not going to run it, but if you download the code, there is a benchmark project. They run the exact code that they use to create this chart in .NET Core and um, to make all the measurements for you that I render here. But so clearly, protobuf is the winner about sites, which is about from 77, 80% down to 66 when there are you know, larger payload. And uh, this really improve the, the performance, but also reduce the network bandwidth utilization, and you know, as I said, less GC uh, generation. So um, the other demo that I want to show is that how we expose gRPC to the browser when actually, uh, you know, currently is not supported. So this demo used a web API as a gateway. In this case, just for fun, I use a WebSocket, SignalR, that used to communicate to the gRPC server is running uh, which uh, then gonna send back a response as a stream of data and output on uh, the web page the, the the stream as a data. Okay, so uh, we are our service still here running. Okay, the so the service is exactly the same that I um, was using. Uh, the application is the web app. So interesting here. In a startup, I had to define actually that I'm going to use gRPC in this case as a client, right? So uh, in a startup of my web app, um, I'm going to pass that add gRPC as a client. And you can see I reference the type as the service, gRPC service client, the target endpoint of the um, service that currently is running in the background as my console app. 
And that's pretty much what I have to do. And here below, I define that uh, I use, you know, signal art. This is not talk about signal art, but just to define where my hub is uh, enabled here. So that's what I have to do. Algeria PC as a client, okay? So the SignalR hub here is posed, um, well, I can access my service client, my GRPC service client, part of uh, the constructor using the penis injection because it was defined on my startup. And then I have a stock market stream here that is going to read the data as a stream from my service um, that you're going to call the stock market stream service and then using the in a synchronous for loop here, read the data and then push the data in a text format to my brighter stream, which is in this case my SignalR WebSocket. And the JSON file is down here, which I enable the SignalR connection. I use the stream connection that called the stock market stream, which is the method that I defined here. There is this mapping method name, match the name of the JavaScript file of the JavaScript. Um, name and then I subscribe the stream using some sort of reactive approach here. So when the um, the signal R, the WebSocket receive the uh, message here for my stream, it's gonna populate the web page. All right, let's run the application here. So this is my survey running here. And I start stream, so my signal R start to read the data from my stream. You can see that there was the response log here. And now I have a stream um, channel open that communicate from my web app, use a signal art that open the client channel to the GRPC service and read it as a stream. All right, so that was cool. So, um, weakness, uh, briefly, there are some limited browser support, again, because GRPC is built on top of HTTP2, which not all the browser uh, supported yet. Probably, you know, I can see in the future that's gonna be something that's gonna be part of the browser, but currently is a little limitation. However, uh, it just, just demonstrate in the preview code, we can use some sort of Web API gateway using Web API or signal as I use to communicate with the backend and GRPC service. So it's a limitation, but it is always a solution. The other limitation is that uh, it's not human readable, like, you know, can be a JSON format. It's a trade-off. Uh, GRPC, you know, use protobuf as a binary format, which is smaller, faster. However, it's not human readable. So if something that you have to use uh, to consider this kind of, of limitation. The other thing, I think I'm out of time, so I'm not gonna run this demo. Uh, I'm gonna just um, show the code here that GRPC use protobuf as main um, um, protocol, control base to generate the, 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 the protobuf. Um, however, uh, and this is great, especially when you communicate from different platforms and different programming languages. However, if your service and client or service service are both in .NET, and you don't want to use or reference any protobuf, you can do all uh, using a code uh, based approach using a, dec a decoration base, like attribute base. This is very similar back in the day in WCF. The only thing when you create your message type is that you have to pass the data member with the order because it's still uh, order based, okay? Uh, not gonna run the demo. The only thing that I want to show here uh, is that the project is up here inside the without protobuf. And the only thing that you have to pass here when you can create the GRPC is actually pass the add code first GRPC, which you will generate the code on the fly. It's going to be penalty the first time call to do the code gen. And that's it. And the client instead is going to create the channel and then create the GRPC service rather than using the code gen GRPC service client past an interface, which is simply the concept they want to use to communicate between the client and the server. Um, but that's pretty much what I want to show here. You can bypass the use of the protobuf file 
just all in one, all in code if you want to. All right, that's all to wrap up. Um, I want to show the the fact that the different kind of communication technology we have available today from the rest, which is great for pure web apps and crowd operation, uh, multi signal art for multicasting web messages. I uh, uh, demonstrate signal art earlier. Um, GraphQL, I don't have a great experience in that, but it's great for querying a large data set. And then we have generally see now this new tool to, to have in your tool belt that supports streaming support, very low resource consumption, cross-platform, and lightning fast. I love GRPC performance. So um, to summarize, cross-platform, very fast, efficiency for microservice architecture for communication with their speed are uh, critical component, and especially for realization. Uh, I have in the past issue with project that to serialize, that serialize a big JSON data, and there's a spike of CPU consumption. GRPC can reduce that like by 80%, which is phenomenal. And here is my, are my contact, Twitter, uh, theory case, my email, um, and uh, this is the link where you can download all the source code I demonstrate uh, in the uh, in this presentation. And now I open for a question, if any. Otherwise, I'm going to put a slide here with my link. Any question? Awesome. Thank you, Ricardo, first of all, for a very, very interesting session. Uh, there are actually quite a few questions. And to those right. people who have just asked new questions, uh, I'm not sure we can cover them all, but still, yeah. uh, we'll give it a go. Uh, I'll let you choose. I have topics around coding, architecture, serialization, connectivity, and security. Oh, wow. All, all sexy for me. Well, let's go to yeah. architecture and coding first. For all right. Let, let's start with coding first. Uh, probably a yes, no question. Is the gRPC client class thread safe? Uh, well, yes. So in short, yes. All right. That's, that's an easy one. Uh, what would you recommend for building proto files and to send data classes with many properties over gRPC? Should that just be duplicated in the proto file or is there an easier way? Uh, so um, you can proto file can reference other proto files, right? So I probably break apart all the proto file that you want to use in different files and use that to manage um, the, the different uh, um, you know, messages and services. Um, and uh, I don't know if that's part of the question, but uh, you can, you know, create your own NuGet package. So different programming languages can download the NuGet package you reference all the proto files you prepare. So it's always up to date with the latest version. So you can you can use it that and keep it the code gen um, up to date. All right. One related to that maybe is how would you do contract versioning in uh, gRPC? Uh, so this is a, I uh, didn't cover this in this talk. That's a good question. So uh, protobuf is an ordinal base. However, uh, the order matter, but you can miss some number. And uh, there are also some keyword in a protobuf file that you can use for um, tell that that's going to be numbered, going to be used in a different version or that's for future compatibility. There is a library provided by gRPC. Um, I forgot the name, it started with the M. I think it's a Mesat, Mesat, I forgot. I can probably find out, but there is a library that gRPC provide to make versioning easier too. All right, cool. Uh, shall we switch to serialization maybe? Yeah, sure. Um, have you ever used message pack instead of protobuf or does that not work with uh, gRPC? Uh, I use that now in the gRPC context. So that would be interesting to use. Now saying that, uh, this is a good question because gRPC use protobuf as default, but does not uh, prevent you to use your own uh, type of serialization. So I would say that, yes, you can replace it, but uh, that's based on the documentation that I read, but I never try it.
All right, perfect. Uh, then another one, in a stack of microservices with GraphQL, does it make sense to use gRPC for the inter-service communication and leave GraphQL, for example, for just the external calls? It does, however, uh, um, I think that you will be, I think it does, uh, I was thinking you probably will lose the stream capabilities, but re relatively, not completely, because depending on how you build your GraphQL API, you can still use streaming in the back. So uh, yeah, I think that will make sense, yes. All right, cool. Um, are you up for two more maybe? Yeah, let's do it. All right, uh, around that long-lived stream, is that a real-time stream or do you have to actually call it to receive the stream? And also when it disconnects, is there a reconnect capability there? Uh, yes and yes. So yes, it's a real-time, uh, which is very cool. And uh, it does reconnect for you. So I didn't show, uh, you know, there is a lot of stuff I could show here. This is more low level, but yeah, you can, there is a policy that you can pass in your PC and uh, when you create your uh, both the client or the server in this case uh, i would think that mostly going to happen the client side and you can pass a policy how to handle reconnection if the connection drop very good question yes all right cool makes sense uh there's a couple of questions around using tls and SL, ssl on setting that up but i guess those are practical ones that people can probably reach out or maybe yeah. find on uh, on your blog and, and other resources yeah. There is, yeah. however, one interesting one. Uh, how would you go about authenticating gRPC services? Uh, so it's support both. Uh, so if you build an API, Web API is a gateway. Of course, you can leverage that. However, uh, API is, uh, gRPC is very secure. In the source code, um, I have actually did not demonstrate the code, but I think it's somewhere here um, where you can pass even certificate, I think you can see my code here, and also authenticate it also, um, very easy to integrate uh, on the GRPC side. Uh, I wish I have a source code, but I can tweet the link about it. But yeah, it's very easy. Uh, the Microsoft really did a fantastic job to uh, make GRPC easy to integrate without a record. And um, even authentication is very easy to, to um, inject in, in your in your in your code. All right, cool. Thank you. Um, I guess that's pretty much it. There's one very, very big question that I think uh, warrants a session on its own, which is around using gRPC over a service bus uh, kind of architecture. So unless yeah. you can maybe answer it in a couple of sentences, it may make sense to just reach out to Ricardo. But I'll leave yeah, that. I, you know, uh, I'm very friendly, so send me an email <laughs> and a tweet. I'll be happy to to answer. This uh, actually probably uh, it'd be interesting actually if I can write a blog about architecture around the grid GPC in different architecture. But uh, yeah, please feel free to contact me. This is my email, T Ricardo Gmail, and my Twitter. So and uh, yeah, download the code and play with that. All right, cool. Uh, well, thanks again, and also thanks for handling a, uh, a large load of questions as well. Um, people uh, who still have an open question, I'm sorry we didn't get to it, uh, but I guess we'll wrap up here, so let's switch back to my screen. All right, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure.